Morning, everybody. We'll start in just a moment. Waiting for everybody to be able to join the meeting this morning. Okay, good morning and welcome. My name is Teresa Murad and I'm the Director of Education and Diversity Programs at the Ecological Society of America. So we're back for day two of our very first virtual live discovery doing science education conference. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday, you heard how we were uh, formed by uh, a group of professional societies. And those are our live discovery partners, uh, Botanical Society and the Society for the Study of Evolution, and of course, the Ecological Society of America. So we've kind of stayed together for since the, uh, actually even before 2013, we kind of stayed together because we really wanted to uh, advance exchange and use of digital education resources. And here on this screen is a, uh, a set of objectives that we have for this conference. And that includes fostering communities of practice, uh, which is why we keep doing these events, and also a culture of publishing uh, in education so that we can share education resources with one another through our live discovery uh, Live Discovery at Digital Library, or LDDL for short. And so the, the LDDL is made up of three portals uh, for each of our societies. So there's the EcoEd Digital Library, there's the Plant Ed Digital Library, and the Evo Ed Digital Library. It all goes in the same database in the end, but uh, the review processes are different for each of the uh, libraries. And uh, so each of our societies have our editors and reviewers uh, and uh, the criteria that we have set up in our societies for uh, the review of these materials. So uh, do check that out because there's lots of lots of uh, teaching materials already there and um, most of them are reviewed. Um, we have some that are not, for example, you know, like the um, uh, images, but uh, as a whole teaching resources that you want to use in the classroom, all of them are peer reviewed. So uh, I'd like to actually introduce the planning committee because this event has, uh, you know, has a lot of people working behind the scenes and uh, our planning team is made up of Andrew, uh, Megan, Katrina, Arietta, Rich, Paul and Tom and you'll meet them uh, as we go along. You might have already met some of them yesterday uh, in some of the sessions. They are helping to facilitate many of the sessions. So, um, so that's our planning team. And uh, unfortunately, Andrew, uh, he should be uh, making the, the uh, introduction this morning. He's unable to, due to his academic uh, responsibilities and his own institution uh, at this time. So we are not able to uh, meet him this morning, but he'll be back later. I also want to thank our collaborators. Uh, so we have a, a whole team of collaborators who are helping us to promote the uh, uh, the event. So thank you to all our collaborators for, for the help and assistance. And of course, I want to give credit to our wonderful staff. So uh, at this time, we have Jordan Macy, who is my intern right now for the fall semester, and Jessica Johnston, who ha you have heard from uh, uh, through all the emails. And uh, so that's her right there. And she's been amazing to work with and has pulled this event together. And here's the conference chair, as I mentioned, he is unable to join, but he will be back. And so I uh, just want to kind of give you a, a brief overview. Some of you who have been here yesterday already know this. Every day we have a whole agenda made up of keynotes, the education share fair, the 4DE showcase, the panel presentations, and then breakouts and the networking topics. So be sure to stay with us uh, to the end of the day. Don't don't skip out if you can. I know a lot of your responsibilities do pull you away, but try to come back. Okay. And if you have any questions, again, we uh, you can contact LDC at ESA.org or call the number uh, on the screen, uh, which is also on our website. So, right. And uh, as far as uh, the, the virtual experience, this is the first time for, for us to do the uh, virtual conference like this. Um, so, you know, what we want to do is build a positive, inclusive experience. Uh, we ask you to rename yourself so that you can include your affiliation. You can do this by clicking on your name and uh, and there will be a uh, option to uh, to rename yourself. Okay, And also, if, if you would like to speak at any time during the, the conference, 
please also identify yourself, your name and affiliation uh, so that people know where you're from and the context in which you are asking questions or making comments. And suddenly uh, use the chat function freely in the webinar format like what we have now uh, when the when our keynote joins us uh, you will be using more of the Q&A feature so look for that in the menu on uh, in the zoom menu that you will see on your screen and that's where we would like to have the questions posted rather than the chat uh, for the plenaries and talking about uh, the zoom features uh, also like to uh, also draw your attention to the fact that if somebody's sharing screens like what I'm doing now, um, you can also go to the top right of your um, a screen and choose the side by side view so that you can see both the speaker as well as the presentation. And then the final thing I would like to just uh, make a note of is this idea of take space, make space. So some of us are really, um, you know, uh, not shy at all, right? And and you know, uh, able to speak freely in a large meeting, and others are, you know, less um, uh, perhaps uh, you know less vo verbal. But we would like to uh, allow that space. So uh, you know, maybe those of you who are a, a little more confident in these sorts of settings, perhaps hold back a little bit to see if others would like to speak. And we also ask that you use the raise your hand function. All right, so this is not just for this uh, particular time, but for the, the, the rest of the meeting as well, for the rest of the conference. And of course, if you've already spoken, give others a chance. So, um, so in this way, we hope that everybody will have a chance to speak and participate. So now I would like to introduce our uh, uh, planning committee member who is going to introduce our speaker this morning. And this is uh, Dr. Rich Clement, and he's from the uh, Cedar Creek uh, College. Uh, so he, I'm sorry, Cedar Crest College, excuse me. <laughs> and so uh, Rich is with the Society for the Study of Evolution. So he's our leader from uh, our partner society. And he's organized uh, undergraduate diversity um, at evolution types of, of events. He had, he's also the, uh, of course, the lead editor of the uh, SSE's EvoEd digital library. So if you want to publish anything in EvoEd DL, Rich is the uh, uh, editor that you want to talk with. And his interests are really broad. He's you know really uh, been teaching and doing research on evolution in ecology involving genetics and and genomics. So uh, he brings this perspective to our event here and our uh, uh, conference. And uh, without further ado, then I would like to turn it over to Rich so he can uh, introduce us to Brian. Thanks, Teresa. Um, yeah, and, and just to, to be clear, there actually is a Cedar Creek that, <laughs> that runs behind Cedar Crest and we take our students there for uh, ecology labs and things like that. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm very happy to be able to, to introduce Brian uh, Drewsbury today. Uh, he is the uh, an associate professor of biology at the University of Rhode Island, uh, principal investigator of the Science Education Society Research Program, uh, which studies the social context of teaching and learning in formal and informal settings. Uh, he studies how students develop perceptions of the world and others and how these perceptions impact life decisions, including retention in STEM fields. Uh, he conducts professional development for faculty and staff on inclusive practices in higher ed, uh, and has worked with many colleges and universities across North America. He's a fellow of the John N. Gardner Institute for Excellence in Undergraduate Education. Uh, a recent profile uh, of Brian's efforts to boost success in introductory biology uh, which is a traditionally high DFW course, right? We, we know this, uh, ends with, with this, this very inspiring quote. Uh, he says, in bumbling through my initial semesters as a TA, I learned the value not of content delivery, but of what it means to teach someone to believe they could be better than what they imagined. This belief is the fire that propels ordinary people to do great things. Uh, and so I'm very pleased to um, introduce Brian for today's keynote address. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Teresa. Um, and Teresa, I'm here. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so I'm glad to be here and welcome to welcome to the conference. Uh, just let me share my screen real quick. All right, I just want to spend a few minutes talking with you this morning about a class that's that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, many people in this audience probably would have taken this class at some point. Um, many in this audience probably teach this class currently or uh, taught it at some point in their career. And, you know, it, it's a class that has, has really helped me, I guess, evolve as, a, as an instructor, as a human. Um, the voices of the students who graciously share their words with me every semester through reflection assignments um, just teach me so much, so much about the human experience. And it's a class that brings me a lot of sadness, not the class itself, but just how the class I think has been treated historically, right? Um, especially at research focused universities where research faculty get rewarded for things other than say how they conduct a class like this. And so, you know, human behavior dictates that you run to where the incentives are. And so people will put more of the efforts and the resources and the things that would grant them better reviews and better promotion opportunities and things like that. So as a result, the class gets, um, you know, handed off to, to you know, a, a large adjunct staff in some cases or, um, and to very, very good practitioners. But in, in sometimes those practitioners aren't rewarded in the way that they should, right? Especially for a class that's so pivotal for students for whom this class is their real first entry into um, uh, science at the college level. So I wanna offer you like just some brief thoughts on how I think we should be thinking about intro bio. Um, we only have uh, uh, 30 minutes, so it's, you know, I would like to talk more, but, but certainly I hope to kind of get your brain a little bit stimulated on on ways in which this class can be elevated to the important level that it can be, right? So if you're like me, um, this was your trajectory, right? Intro bio was you start from small things and then you, you know, at the end of semester two or semester one, depending on you are where you are, you're talking about organismal diversity and ecology and things like that. Um, I'm not here to so much critique that, that you know, that's fine, that is what it is. Um, there's a little bit of that being dictated by textbooks, et cetera, but that's a separate conversation. Um, and I'm encouraged to see the likes of some different kinds of models out there like course-based undergraduate research experiences, which is taking a much more um, uh, practical and hands-on and skills-based approach to teaching some of this content, right? My issue is, not how the content is taught and what methods are used. Um, my issue is, I'm sorry. My issue is the over focus on content. Okay, can, can you wait? Can you wait? Sorry, I have a three year old who, who doesn't realize I'm giving a talk. Um, my issue is the over focus on content. I come from a school of thought. Uh, that Paolo Frey talks about in, in many of his writings, and you know, you could go to John Dewey, which is before that, where education is a, a, is a possibility to remake yourself, all right? So when you are in class, when students are in class, this is not just about how they acquire content, right? It's about how they think of themselves differently in the world in which they live. We can use content to drive that different way of thinking. We can use content to help them challenge orthodoxies, right? But the remaking of the self is a very, very, very important part of the pedagogical experience. So when, when people ask questions to me about, you know, inclusive practices and, you know, Brian, can you give me like the five, six things I need to do to make the classroom? Well, it's not five, six things you need to do. Right? It's a mindset change that needs to happen. Right? So if you want to separate it out, separate it out into two bins. You, if you want to think about content, fine. Think about ways in which you can use more culturally relevant examples. Think about ways in which, you know, I, I don't know, the way in, ways in which you teach genetics, promote fixed mindsets about race. That I thought, think those are very worthy projects. Right? But inclusive practices at the core of it 
is how you develop relationships with people, right? How you develop those relationships in such a way that students trust that in your classroom, that is a place in which they can go ahead, uh, uh, begin the remaking process at the college level. So from that lens, intro bio is more intro than bio. I wanna be very clear with you. I am not dismissive of bio content. I enjoy it, I have you know, three degrees in biology and I, I really do enjoy it. But what those degrees have certainly shown me is that there's no end in sight for the amount of information there is that is you know, of biology content. So if my focus was to try to get through 50 chapters in a pre-assigned textbook, then I'm, I'm waging a losing battle, right? Um, what I need to understand that for the very traditionally aged students that I have, that 17 and a half, 18 years of, of age, when they walk into my classroom, this is a transition period. For my marginalized students who may come into my classroom with, with little to no social capital, they are trying to figure out how to do this college thing. They are trying to figure out if they belong in a STEM classroom. They are trying to figure out if somebody like me, not, not me, Brian Dewsbury, but me like them, can one day go on and become a scientist of, of some different, uh, you know, of different types, right? Some of them walk into my classroom as the most amount of white students they've ever seen in their entire lives. So cue all of the social belonging triggers and everything like that, right? These are emerging adults. This is a, this is a term that comes from literature. I forgot the author's name. I think Bennett is his name. Um, it's a time of exploration. It's a time when you're trying to find out who they are. I mean, it is not surprising that uh, uh, first year students, the, the largest percentage of people who um, come out as LGBT identified happen in that year because it's a time of exploration. And the class being the first college level science class that they, they are taking um, is the beginning of a different kind of STEM identity. So it matters that Brian is the person in front of them and they, they see that you know, a, a black male is a scientist and we give examples of that. So what, what I'm trying to say with these three points is that if I don't attend to the psychological being of the students in front of me, I could run through all the chapters I want to in the world. I can use all the clickers. I can use all the, the you know, immediate assessment technique. I can use all the tricks and all the tips. But if I'm not speaking to who they are on the inside, then they're just as likely to leave as if I didn't, right? And that means being willing to sacrifice some of that content to speak to the person inside and cultivate their mind in such a way that they believe when they leave this classroom, they can be a scientist like anybody else. So I'll introduce you briefly to a group of students who really taught me this in, in, in ways that, um, you know, to this day I'm humbled by, you know, uh, this is the first group of students I ever taught. I was a grad TA uh, back at Florida International University. It was a wonderful time. Um, I sucked. I didn't know what I was doing. I was given a syllabus with rules and things you had to do and just say, all right, good luck, you know. So that, that was STEM training at that time. But they were very, very gracious. This is a picture from the Everglades and I still have this picture in my office to this day. Um, they were gracious and one of the things they did with their grades is we used to talk a lot, you know, when, you know, that downtime, when experiments are being run, we just sit and talk and we talk about being first generation American. We talk about why they're pursuing medical degrees. You know, you would talk about what they expect to get out of this education process and what education means to them. And what became apparent from those conversations was that what they were hoping to get from it was so distant to what we as professors and TAs were providing, right? People were looking beyond at, you know, careers that had a certain monetary value that would move, that would make them economically mobile, right? Nobody was sitting there saying, I really want to learn about that species of butterfly. No disrespect to butterflies, they're great. But as, that curiosity wasn't there. 
it was a completely utilitarian process, right? And if if we had this, if we were designing a syllabus, a curriculum, just to deliver stuff, we were feeding into that mindset. We were feeding into just get the A and move on, right? But what we did, and you know, I've given other talks about this, was purposely redesign that curriculum to um, you know, take away some of that, you know, information deluge and focus on identity building experiences. And that, you know, so I, I you know, I've been to assessment res, uh, workshops and all curriculum design workshops and things like that. But when people ask me the things that have inspired me the most about the way in which I teach today, I, I take them right back to this group of students. Um, and I, and I want to emphasize this because a lot of times we want to you know, look up papers and look up meta-analyses and all these things, sometimes the best data points that you can have are seated right in front of you. You just need to take the time to ask them the right questions. Right. So as a, as, a, as a goal, as an aspirational dream of mine, um, I, I, I want to know that in 10, years from now, 20 years from now, that we are not having the kinds of conversations we're having now about inclusion. Um, I, I am happy to see more people come to the table now and, and be willing to join book groups and willing to uh, you know, look at their practices. This, this, this has to go somewhere, right? This, this, has to, this has to manifest into tangible things that happen in the classroom and, and things that happen with your behavior and your choices, right? This ca just can't just be about lives mattering. It has to be about what you actively do to protect those lives, right? So when I think about my classroom, this is what I want it to feel like. I, I want you to walk in and, and those psychological triggers that people write and study, I, I want you to walk in and feel none of that. I want you to walk in and, and even, even if you do for like 10 seconds, I want you to quickly realize that in this space, everyone's ready to rock and roll. Everyone has your back. Everyone can critique you respectfully. You can do the same. Um, we are family. And, and however you, you walk in here, you will leave here having gone through a remaking process, right? Because in that way, I'm sort of preparing you to, to uh, be part of the power structure going forward, you can help shape your own future. You're not in here to just be told what chapter one to chapter nine says, you're here to engage in a dialogue about scientific reality. So I wanna offer you um, three, three thoughts on how I would like people to think about reclaiming the intro and intro bio. And you know, each of them could be its own talk, and I want to just address them separately. And I, I hope, I hope there's follow-up. I hope we can kind of keep this conversation going beyond this conference because they're each so important. One is know who's in front of you. I mean, really know who is in front of you, right? It, they're not just students with ID numbers who registered for a class. They're human beings with narratives, with stories. Um, there are reasons why they are in your class and perhaps not another university. Um, there are challenges they may have overcome to get to your class. Um, there are structures, there are broad social structures that determines who lives in what neighborhood, what high schools, what elementary schools they go to, and then ultimately how the education trajectory is predicted based on those factors. And they have control over none of that. So when I travel the country and talk to people about redlining, some people don't even know what I'm talking about. But if you were you know, up until the 80s, uh, given differential access to, to, um, to mortgage or lending structures, um, you know, let's, let's take it easy and you pull yourself up by your bootstrap stuff. You have to know what forces are working against them. So I'm not saying that you can solve a hundred years of redlining with intro bio. I'm saying that please be aware of who's in front of you and what informs their presence, right? 
This is not a, a how to thing, right? This is a, once you start thinking differently about the world around you, you start seeing your classroom differently, right? So I understand kind of my own context here in Rhode Island. Like I know where they come from. I know the, the stories, I know the gentrification patterns, et cetera, et cetera. But then I also follow that up with, I send them surveys to ask them, you know, questions about their strengths, their things they are proud of, you know, what they plan to be, what they, their goals and, and dreams for the future are, right? I give them reflection assignments. So my favorite is, is called This I Believe, which is from the NPR series. You can go to thisibelieve.org slash forward slash guidelines uh, if you want the prompt that I use, um, because it's a beautiful prompt. Talk about the passions that shape, sorry, talk about the values that shape your passions. So, you know, I know they're hit, you know, I know they're kind of broad historical structures. I know some of the things they share with me in a survey, but now when I read those essays, I get a look into their soul, right? So by the time we start class, this is a different kind of feeling, right? This is not just first day here's the syllabus. It's okay, welcome to the bio one-on-one -on -one community. And when we have one-on-one -on -one conversations, I have narratives and stories to draw from to talk about, you know, how do we make this class the best experience for you? Secondly, design for the psychological and technical self. I am not an active learning hater. In fact, I love it. I do it. It's a weirdly defined thing because anything active is active, right? But one of my issues with some of the active, active learning conversations is that it gets into this sort of seemingly meaningless back and forth between you're active, I'm not, because you're not active, you're a bad person kind of thing. And, and I mean, I don't know, that is what it is. I, I'm not big into kind of labeling my teaching, right? Um, but to me, that debate is still predicated on the technical self, right? That debate is, is still predicated on how to best deliver this information and make it so that it's contextual. And that's very, very important. But you have to design for the psychological self. Let me give you a, a specific example of that. My intro bio class has four, what we'd call summative exams, 15% each, right? Um, to the students is a big deal, and I guess that's why it's called summative. There are a whole bunch of other things, you know, case studies, um, pre-class stuff that they can do to earn credit in the classroom. But when they take that first exam, it's 15%, one five of the final grade. So you can do the math to understand that somebody could actually get a zero and still have 85% of the class where they can get a grade, uh, sorry, do well. They can actually find their way back because passing, passing is a 70%, right? Now, even people who bomb the first exam don't get zero, right? It's out of 50 points. So if you get 25 out of 50, you know, which is not good, right? You still only lost seven and a half percent on your final final score. That is done intentionally because I'm trying to design for the psychological self. I understand that as first year students, the reasons why they may struggle out of the gates do not necessarily have anything to do with their ability to do science and love science, right? So if I have a, an assessment structure that is so high stakes that it conks them out after week three, then I'm actually not assessing ability, I'm assessing fear. I'm assessing who came in my class with the social capital to, to navigate this, right? Who uh, you know, came in believing and, and knowing how to study from day one, right? So what these first suite of assignments does, they're less, they're less, they're not assessments in the sense that they are evaluative per se, they're assessments in the sense that they're providing myself and the students some information around which we can have a very specific discussion about how to get you not to just know it, but know that you know it, right? Where the, the metacognition piece, right? So I, 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 can, I do that because I understand for, that for many of my students, that psychological piece is critically important, right? 
Um, and I can go through many other examples. Like I, I call my office hours, or I call them student hours in the dorm where the students live. Because for some students that walk up four flights of stairs and down the hall to my office is like the green mile. <laughs> and, and who wins if I just sit in my office for two hours and nobody comes because they're scared? Who wins with that, right? So meet them where they are. We average 25, 30 students a session, right? And, and as I, as I you know, I'm now in a space where I have the trust and we can build that dialogue, right? We can talk about, yeah, okay, now you're talking to me. See, I'm a normal person, it's fine. This is the same for other professors. So I'll meet them where they are, but I'm also helping them build that resilience going forward. Third, track student pathways. What I mean by this is, and I know many of you already do this, but I, I think it's worth reiterating that we should have mechanisms by which we understand that we measure student success beyond the final grade of our course, course right? Um, you know, we, we, uh, you know, we have in review a paper now, you know, we looked at uh, students who were in this inclusive section. And one of the things we did was we cut like 40% of the content. And, um, you know, the obvious pushback is, well, you know, if you're not going to tell them this, how would they possibly be able to do it, do this class at the 200 level or 300 level? And we show that not only can they do it just as well, they actually do better than their peers. Um, because if you teach students how to learn, then, you know, half of that stuff they could actually do on their own. They don't need you physically there, right? But we were able to do that because we followed them into their junior and senior years. So, you know, while I love intro bio, I, I want us to take kind of a broad lens of what the purpose of this class can be, right? Yeah, you know, there, there are things in, in biology I want you to be, as a student, I want you to be able to talk about and feel comfortable and see sort of the wonder and glory of what this, this field has to offer, right? Um, but I want some sense that this process we're doing is, is preparing you for other classrooms and other inclusive experiences that do the same thing on a whole other level. So I, I want you to both think about the structure of your class, but also ensure that it's connected to a, a more broader, long-term enriching inclusive experience in biology at your campus. So whether that means, you know, tracking their grades going forward, uh, you know, if, if that's how you want to measure things, um, whether that means tracking, you know, retention or all of the above, um, but also social measures like sense of belonging, departmental climate, like, you know, or, or get feedback from them with focus groups if you, if you have that kind of capacity. Uh, but don't let it just be, I did this in my class and then now we're done, <laughs> right? They got a grade and therefore what I did worked. Um, we have to be a bit more uh, sophisticated than that. So I'll, I'll, I'll close by, you know, with, with this question, because this, this is, it's been a really guiding question, honestly, of, of the faculty development that I do. And, and that is, so many of us, myself included, to be honest, we was raised in a world where, you know, you got a PhD in, in this very narrow, you know, research focus. And somehow that gave you the, the um, license to go and teach a classroom, um, which I think is kind of a criminal, uh, you know, corollary. Like, I don't understand that concept, right? Now, things are changing a little bit, right? But I think for people who are already teaching, when people like Brian Dewsbury come along and say, you know, let's dial back on that content, right? I know you're an expert in such and such, right? But if you think of yourself as a scientist, what you do for a living is ask beautiful questions and go through a process to pursue that, right? How can we bring that spirit into an intro bio classroom? And people kind of get a little rattled, right? Because if your whole professional identity is, is, is circled around the delivery of stuff, then I get this question back to me, Brian, what, what shall I teach? And I want you to perhaps think of teaching not as teaching biology, but teaching students, as Elizabeth Mohe would say. You teach students. So yes, you, you want to bring that wonder and that, that, that passion of pursuing biology into the classroom. But to do so, you need to connect with the students as individuals. And for some of you, that may mean 
going on a bit of an education journey and learning what that is. So do seek out the references, right? Read Paolo Freire's work, read Bell Hooks's work, read John Dewey, read Ira Shaw. I mean, read people who talk about being human in science classrooms and what that's like and have that change a little bit how you view your students and hopefully get you to ask different kinds of questions about how you teach. So I will stop there. I'm grateful that you're here and I, I hope you have a great conference. I, I think, Teresa, we have um, time for questions. Um, in fact, you know what, I'm gonna share my screen again, just to make sure that if you, um, I, I'm leaving, I, I'll share my screen again because if we don't get to your questions today, I just wanna encourage you to reach out to me if you, you know, if something pops in your head two, three, four weeks from now, that's my email. Um, and I, I will reply because I do really enjoy these conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. So yeah, we have, uh, we have plenty of time for questions and uh, some have come in through the, um, the Q and A tool. Um, I sent something in the chat, but I forgot to mention it at the beginning. So notice that at the bottom of the screen, there's a place where you can type in questions, uh, questions for Brian. And, uh, and what happens is they get promoted to the top based on sort of upvotes. So uh, the first question um, uh, from, uh, from Marnie is, I struggle finding the time to just chat with students during remote teaching. I know how important it is to get to know students as people. I try to chat with students and get to know them, especially during breakout rooms, but it is harder than in person. Uh, any tips for how to replicate the in-person experience better in the virtual environment? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good question. And, and you know, maybe, honestly, I would say, I, I don't wanna be pessimistic here, um, but I also wanna be realistic that, you know, perhaps in our current situation, we shouldn't be thinking so much of trying to replicate as opposed to trying to make as, as good an, as an experience as we can based on the resources we have available. And that includes, those resources include your own capacity and bandwidth to engage fully, right? I mean, I know I'm asking a lot of you right now, uh, but I, I mean, I have, I mean, I'm giving this talk and my three-year-old is trying to like bang down the door. I mean, we, you know, I know there are a lot of parents trying to balance work and home. And, and so, so I just want to be cognizant and respectful of that, right? So having said that, I can just tell you from my own experience with IntroBio, um, I do a hybrid, high flex, whatever you call it these days model where I teach in person and then the other two thirds of the class live stream in, right? Um, everyone's six feet apart in person and it's, it's, you know, it's different. We don't like it, but everyone's following the rules. We've kept the positivity rates down. So it's actually been going well. Um, in Zoom, my office hours, I, you know, we get pretty good attendance in, in Zoom office hours. Um, and what I do is like part of the Zoom office hours, we, um, we do a lot of breakout rooms. Cause so somebody will ask a question and say, all right, I'm not going to just answer for you. We're gonna, are gonna have your colleagues. And so then I kind of pop in rooms. So they're in a breakout room for like 30 minutes, right? And I'll pop in room by room and spend like five, eight minutes just kind of talking to them about the question, about other things. Um, some students, uh, uh, you know, do meet with me one-on-one -on, -one on Zoom, but by having those breakout rooms and those smaller sessions within office hours, I get that some of one-on-one -on -one time without having to add it to extra things. So I hope that idea um, resonates with you because I know it's I know it's a lot harder now, but I, that's how I try to double up. Um, the, the other thing I want to add, Rich, if, if I may, uh, is a lot of times when we talk about getting to know students, the assumption that it ha is, is that it has to be a one-on-one -on -one type discussion. And I just want to encourage you that if you are, if you take the mentality of I teach students and not biology, then you understand that any interaction you have with a student in any forum, any media, or any size is an opportunity for education to happen. So when I talk about dialogue, I don't just mean one on one, and you know it happens to be this kind of intimate thing. I mean when I'm in the classroom as well, right? I mean 
when we're in large groups of office hours. I mean, when I'm communicating through email, right? Because you actually never know what a student might pick up on that might really inspire them, right? Or make them think differently about something else. So dialogue is a, is a fairly loose term in this context. I just want, want you to you know, consider that as well. All right, thanks. Um, so I made a mistake uh, at some point. Uh, I hit uh, that a question had been answered and it went to another place, but I've, I've found it again. Um, and so this is a, a question from Rebecca. Um, what are your thoughts about motivating or bringing out students who come in saying that their stated primary focus is to finish college so that they can move on to make money? How do you help them shift their mindset from college as a hurdle slash checkbox to college as this transformative experience? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I mean, you know, the first answer, the first, my first response to that is you need to understand as an instructor why a student might have that mindset, right? So if you were privileged enough to go to college and, you know, to find yourself, <laughs> um, explore all the beautiful majors they have and, enjoy this liberal arts experience or whatever, um, that's a great thing. I mean, that's a great privilege to have. But if you grew up with scarcity um, and, and, you know, I, 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 you know, I've had so many students with that experience, um, you spend a lot of your time trying to figure out how to get out of that scarcity. And so it's, it's I, I completely understand <laughs> that if you were sold this notion that getting this degree was the means to alleviate that scarcity, then that's the mindset that you're gonna have, right? So I just wanna first urge that we kind of have some understanding around what that is. And there's some really, you know, I would err on the side of reading personal stories to understand this. So there's a beautiful book I read many years ago called um, uh, The Life and uh, The Tragic, the Tragic Life of Robert Peace, P-E-A-C-E. -E. I think that was it. Um, just a, a, re a really sad but wonderful story. Then another book called, um, uh, oh my God, what is it called? The Guy Went to Brown. Anyway, I forgot the second one, but I, I know the two because I usually have um, Hope in the Unseen, right? Hope in the Unseen is the second one by Ron Suskind, right? Um, and I usually recommend that book, some of those books to my grad students to understand what that scarcity mindset is. Okay, so that's that's one. Number two, once you sort of understand that, um, you engage with the students about that, right? And you know, talk to them about, you know, why uh, why they kind of need that, and you know, knowing that you kind of have some sense of it, right? And perhaps discuss with them strategies. Um, ways in which they can pursue certain kinds of careers that, you know, you know, are paying because money is important, um, and um, but but also kind of something that they actually enjoy doing. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to disrespect the need for financial alleviation, but you want to perhaps contextualize that and say, okay, I understand that. So let's let's see if we can uh, find something that both achieves uh, the, the stability you need, but also speaks to some of the things that you love in life. Um, just to answer to the chat real quick, the, the, the author of Hope in the Unseen, Hope in the Unseen is the book, Runs Skank. Anyway, um, so I hope that answers your question, uh, Rich. So again, engage engage why they have that, but but be able, be willing to talk to them about, you know, achieving that stability, but at the same time, um, but at the same time, finding things that they actually enjoy doing. All right, thanks, thanks. Uh, there's a question, um, it's actually a request. Uh, the next one that's come up uh, from Sean and it's, uh, I would love to get a short recommended reading list from you. Uh, is there any way that that can happen? Yeah, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna type, I hope I'm not breaking rules here, but I'm gonna type my, my lab website in the chat and on, oh, Actually, I just sent it to Jessica privately. Um, but if you go to seasprogram.net, uh, 
there's one of the tabs. I don't know why I can't remember the tab. One of the tabs there has a, a reading list, a suggested reading list. Um, I have a more updated one. So if the person wants to reach out to me by email, I'm happy to just reply with the list. Um, but on my website, there's a list of ones, uh, books and podcasts and things that they can engage in. Great. Um, uh, the next question uh, this is an anonymous question. Um, those of us who are white, middle-aged and relatively prosperous may not have much credibility as we work to build inclusive class. Oh dear. Oh, Rich, I think you uh, broke up for a minute. I think it broke up too. Can can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you, Rich. You, you, so you yes. said those of us are white, prosperous, and middle-aged. Go on. And relatively prosperous mm -hmm. may not have much credibility as we work to build inclusive classrooms. What is the most important thing that we can do to convey our commitment to this issue? There are a lot of things you can do, Anna, but I just want to maybe push back a little bit on, on, on the use of the word credibility. Um, and I, I mean, I understand where it's coming from. So I'm, I'm not so much critiquing the use of the word, but I, I guess I'm of the mindset, right? That, that if according to that aspirational view I shared with you 10, 20, 30 years from now, we all need to lock arms and move forward on this, right? So whether you, you're white, Middle East and prosperous or black Middle East and prosperous, you know, regardless of what your American experience has been, if we're going to move towards we are all brothers and sisters um, and our nationality or our, our humanity comes first be, be, before some of that those other categories, then we can't use our our demographic or our socioeconomic status as an albatross that prevents us from doing good work, right? And so, so while I appreciate your transparency in where you are, I just want you to know that I view you as a potential soldier and ally in this in this work. And so to, so to do that, to move forward, you sort of have to start kind of, you have to start listening and learning. All right. And I'll use a personal example. When I was an undergraduate, um, I, I held very, very conservative views on LGBT culture, right? Um, probably up until my sophomore or junior year, right? I unfortunately, I didn't witness this, but unfortunately there was an incident where a young man who was LGBT identified, um, somebody accused him of making a pass at them and that person returned with a baseball bat, attacked him, cracked his head open. And it was a real moment of awakening for me because I, I felt I didn't swing the bat, but I felt I was party to that crime because of the views that I had on gay marriage and things like that, right? So that that transformation forced me into a space to sort of think and reflect on my views and actions and and you know uh, opinions before that. But then I had to read, right? Then I had to kind of learn. I had to to talk to people from that community, but not burden them with the task of teaching me everything. So I had to do my own work. I had to read. Judith Butler's work, right? I, I had to, you know, you know, like the story of Harvey Milk. You know, I mean, I had to read and I kind of sit with this. And I had to go places and commune and and understand and see humanity and and learn. And it, it takes a while, right? But as your radar gets sharpened, you you actually then know what to do. You know how to go in spaces and know when to listen and when to speak up. Right, and you know that being white and middle class and prosperous doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't things you can do to address this. You can speak about race and class and isms in your classroom, right? But you can also listen to marginalized students who might be wanting to tell your story. And I can tell you this from experience, nothing builds trust like students who know that you are willing to listen, that you are not just nodding them along and, you know, uh, you know, kind of refuting what they're saying or getting into any, any kind of kind of argument. You just want to listen. In fact, there's a word for it comes from the um, restoration. Sorry, uh, I forget the word, but it's called apophatic is the word. Apophatic listening to put your own thoughts in abeyance and just truly listen. So my advice would be learn but be willing to listen. And I think when you do that, then you sort of will know what to do. 
All right, so the next question uh, is similar to one that I'd actually uh, written down uh, from Mark Perkins. Um, so what he's asking is, do you have thoughts on how to help develop inclusive pathways and content lighter courses at community colleges? Or they teach uh, maybe two semesters of majors intro bio before students transfer to one or a, a dozen or more state universities and their programs have to articulate with that. And my related question is, you know, in a large institution like yours, how do you convince colleagues that less is more, right? How, how do you get them perhaps to, to take more responsibility for the foundational material so that you can do uh, what you need to do or what you, you think that we should be doing at the intro level? Patience. Lots and lots of patience and perhaps something a little bit stronger than that sometimes, right? So, I mean, I, I've been having this conversation for a long time and I could, I mean, right now, I'm very happy and excited as to where we are on my institution. Um, you know, we have a committee that's revamping all of intro bio. Um, and, you know, we're going to do some really great things with that, including cutting more content, but focusing on some more skills and bringing in some more inclusive practices, even more than we already do. But it, it took like six years to, to get us to this point. I mean, and I, I hate to kind of say it, but a lot of what we do now, what we're discussing to do now was dead on arrival like in 2014, right? So it, it, it is, you know, I had to kind of understand that not everybody was ready to have that conversation at a certain time. Some people needed to see evidence that, that the practices worked. Some people needed to see the students that I taught end up in their classrooms and see what kind of a different student they can be based on that kind of model. Um, but but I think maybe the answer that, that applies to both your question, Rich, and, and the other persons is having that open communication at all times on what the expectation is when they get to those 200, 300 level courses, right? And how does that align with the ways in which we prepare them at, um, uh, we, we prepare them at, at the 100 level, right? Now for community colleges, you know, it's, a, it's kind of a similar thing. You know, I haven't done this quite yet with community colleges, but I do it with a couple of high schools that I work with, where we look at all the intro science classes and their science teachers at the high school level are looking at, are trying to redesign their science courses to better prepare them for what's being expected at the freshman level. So now if you are showing them a freshman class, a first year student class with a reduced, um, with a reduced content list but focus on skills, now you are pushing a, a secondary science curriculum to focus on that as well, right? So I, I think that open communication is necessary, but to your question about convincing colleagues about cutting content, everyone's gonna get convinced by something different, right? Some people might need to see data points in a graph some people need to see the students that come out of your classroom. Some people need to see your evaluation scores. Some people need like a dean to tell them. I mean, it's, it's interesting how people work in that front. Um, but you have to be kind of ready to kind of tackle it from either direction. Um, Rich, okay. just one second. I want to address, uh, Sean, you're right. I think, I think the list was, we could we actually revamping the website. So that list may not be there. So I'm just going to, just in case it's not there, um, feel free to just email me directly and I'll just send you a weird document. Sorry about that. Yes, Rich. Yeah, so in getting back to, I think a point that, that is buried in Mark's question, but it's really important is, so they have to articulate, right? They're, they're at the community colleges, they know that their students have to bring these intro bio courses to other schools. And so they have that pressure of trying to figure out how to, um, do that course in the right way so that the, the course will be accepted for transfer. Right? Mm -hmm. So they have those additional constraints. Um, and I think that's a real, if I, Mark can correct me, I think that's part of what he's getting at here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, um, yeah, he says, yeah. So, so uh, honestly, Rich, I mean, Mark, I hope you agree with this. I, I know it's a constraint, but it, I actually think it could be an opportunity depending on how the conversation is constructed, right? So for example, at my institution, there is a um, there is a community college, a local community college that, you know, a lot of the students transfer into URI, right? And so the way advising works, you know, there, there's kind, kind of open communication between URI and this, this institution on 
what courses transfer, what's expected to happen in those courses, and um, you know why and how we would accept certain things versus others, right? So instead of that conversation being a uh, like you have to do this, 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 and this, or else we won't accept it. It can be more along the lines of, okay, here is our, um, here are our views on, on what is what skills are necessary to do 200, 300 level courses at my institution are, right? If students are taking bio 101 at your institution versus ours, here's how ours is structured, right? We are going through a process where we are reducing a lot of content to focus on more skills and inclusive practices. And those students are matriculating into 200 and 300 level courses successfully. So you also don't need to feel pressured to cover 45 chapters, right? Feel free to reach out to our Bio 101 team to kind of work on what our intro bio look like and how you can design courses that are similar. So I know it feels a little top down E, but I actually think it could be an opportunity to have a conversation on what's really necessary. Now, the key here is that a lot of that reform is happening, you know, at URI. And so, um, so, so because the reform is happening there, I think it makes it easier, it should help, right? The people who are transferring courses in um, to feel hopefully less pressure on, on cover, 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 and more along the lines of, oh, they actually go into a more skills-based model. Does that answer your question, Mark? Good, you said that, that helps. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, the next question is, is anonymous. Um, over the years, I have had to deal with my own teaching anxiety, which has been a barrier to connecting with my students. Any advice on how to easily open up to my class? Yeah, good question. I mean, um, I want to make a couple of acknowledgements. One is that, you know, when I was a grad student, I read the book uh, Quiet by Susan Cain, talks about introverts, and it, it really, I, I thought it was a really good book. And, you know, sometimes we, again, with the active learning stuff, sometimes we design teaching experiences where the person is expected to kind of be a show person, and the class is bouncing off the walls, and it's not, um, you know, inclusive of people who are, can be excellent in the classroom, both as a practitioner or a student, but perhaps do this in a more introverted way. Um, and I don't know if that's the person's particular thing, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, secondly, I will say that you, you have to kind of find what the root of your anxiety is. I mean, I, and I hate to sound like a therapist because I'm not, um, but I'm just saying this from personal experience. Um, it, it may not seem that way, right? But I, I share a lot of that anxiety every time I go into the classroom, even though I've been doing that for six years now. Um, and I am always in the back of my head afraid that people will not um, view you as an expert, um, that you know there's some kind of imposter syndrome taking place. And I can't get rid of it. I wish I could, but I can't. Um, so what I do is I manage it, right? I, I manage it by before class, I meditate for 10 minutes. Every time, before I teach every single time, I meditate for 10 minutes and center my mind and you know, kind of process my feelings before I walk in. Six years, I do it every single time. Um, I'm very, very critical of myself, of what happens and what went well, what didn't go well. Um, and type A to the very last detail. And so feeling like I have some sense of control of the success of the things that happen, I think helps me you know, ease myself. I also um, allow myself to be a little bit more vulnerable to the students. So you know, I tell them about the struggles I had as an undergrad, even as a grad student, um, so I want them to see me as, as, as human and not superhuman. Um, and that, that helps build the trust, it builds the relationship. Um, and it lessens even my own anxiety because, because I know the expectations are just for me to, to maintain and respect that trust and not necessarily be the answer to all things. So I, I, it's the best answer I can give you not knowing what your specific anxiety is, but um, 
I as hopefully like sharing my story was helpful to you. And I think this this will be our last question after um, it's pointing out that there was a, uh, a, a thumbs up for metacognition. Um, uh, and then uh, um, a, uh, the question from Andrew, uh, I love what you have to say and your message, the devils in the details. And one of the details is that there is little time and space created up oh, jumping around created by the structure of higher ed especially at research universities for developing a growth mindset and faculty that translates eventually into an education experience like the one you're describing uh, that can be scaled to accommodate 1600 students per semester. Uh, where are the leverage points for cultural change? Yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful question, perhaps a good question to end on. Um, you know, what, what, uh, what the, writer said, I think gets to the heart of this problem. And that is, I don't know if he, if they use the words specifically, but I think they said the structure of higher ed. And, and that my friends <laughs> is where this revolution has to get to, right? We can sit up here all day and write all the book lists and all the websites with all these stuff in the assignments and, you know, I, I love all of it. I probably use, you know, 90% of it. But until we start having serious conversations about bandwidth and reward structures and incentive structures and who gets, you know, promoted and reviewed and on what criteria, this is going to have a hard limit. It will hit. That is the com that's the elephant in the room no one's talking about. All right. So um you know, to, to be positive here, I've seen models out there. There's a couple schools that I'm thinking about that have tackled that, right? They've, they've changed their review criteria. They are giving people the bandwidth and the resources to do that scaling that you're talking about. But they are a precious, precious few, right? And so the leverage points to me has to be the ways in which that organically led group of faculty who really believe in this stuff supported by the Teaching and Learning Center meets deans and chairs and, and provosts and presidents who have the bravery and the audacity to, to perhaps be a little less risk averse or, or a little bit more bold and, and say, if inclusion is going to be important, it can't just be us funding the MLK breakfast. It has to be us seeing you know, the actions and the strategies that are working supporting that and asking, you know, using the intellectual power of the campus to figure out how to scale that. Um, I think there are small examples of that happening, but not enough. But you're, but you're right. This, the devil is in the details, and the details has to be how higher it is structured, and and that is going to be, to I think, the next major battle around this this conversation. So, thank you so much for that question. Okay. Um, so I, I think those are the questions. There are a couple more comments. Uh, uh, basically uh, expressing gratitude for uh, what you've had to say today. Uh, some of those have shown up in the Q&A. Some of them have shown up in the chat. Um, I think uh, th this has been really informative, really valuable. Uh, at this point, I think um, Teresa has, um, has something to, to follow up with. <coughs> OK, very good. Yes. That that was a really brilliant uh, um, conversation about reclaiming the intro in intro biology. I think this is so important. Thank you so much for all the themes that you know you've broached, and uh, you know and I think helping us to find our way uh, just by concentrating on and focusing on our students, right, as the as the starting point. And so I would like to actually put that into practice. <laughs> so I would like to uh, also know who is in our community and therefore I'm going to do a little poll, just a very short one, and I hope that uh, everybody will participate and let's see who, who, is, who is with us today. Okay, let's see, I think more or less. Are you all able to see the poll, by the way? Or 
do I have to do something before you can see it? Can somebody answer me because I'm not quite sure if people can see the poll. I, think I can see it, but I, but as a panelist, I can't vote. Okay. Can you, so you can see the answer, uh, the, the response? No, and I can only see the question. Uh, okay. All right. So I think I have to end the, the poll before everybody can see it. Okay. Great. All right. I think that's all that people have. Okay. I'm going to give two, five more seconds for people to respond. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So here we are. Okay, so wow, 74% of people, this is your first conference, welcome. So happy that you're able to join us. And look at this for the second question. Uh, we have more than half of our participants here have taught for more than 10 years and you're still coming back. So that's amazing. Uh, so yeah, thank, thank you all for being here and I see also that there are quite a number who have uh, come before and, uh, and you know, so we have people from uh, different uh, experiences of teaching. So yeah, I, I think as we move on uh, through the day, you know, hopefully that you will be able to also seek each other out, those who have a lot more experience versus those who are just starting out and, uh, you know, support one another. So with that, I'd like to actually um, uh, bring on board uh, Andy. Andy was uh, had to, had to uh, excuse himself early on, but uh, I think he's here with us now. So uh, just to uh, have him talk about what's coming after the break. Andrew. Hi. Thanks for putting me on the spot, <laughs> Teresa. That's great. Yeah, I, and Brian, I just want to thank you. That was tremendous and. That last question I think about a lot because I'm, I'm a chair and today this morning I was actually talking to the provost and it was sort of about issues related to education and COVID time. But uh, this, it seems like this period of time is a, is a time where we're reflecting about the structure of higher ed. And so maybe there'll be positive things coming out of this. Um, but at any rate, so our next, um, awesome event at 1230 Eastern Standard Time is the 4E, 4DE Showcase. Um, and this will be focused on uh, designing assessments that are multidimensional, that, con that connects a lot with the sort of next generation 3D assessment um, framework that exists. And so I'm, I'm really looking forward to this and I hope to see you there. So now you have a break. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you so much, Brian. We'll see y'all later. <laughs>